Good morning, good morning. Morning, Richard. Morning, Phil. Early birds. Yes. Hi, James. Morning, Eileen. Morning, Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Morning, Finn. Welcome, Rashmi. Hey, Lindsay. Hope your job is going well. Hey, Hugo. Tell us where you're zooming in from. Yes. Chat, if you would. As everyone's coming in, my, my morning confession this morning is I'm feeling very left out because both Mark and Suki are dialing in from Cornwall. So I've decided to put myself in a little bit of a better mood and give myself a bit of a virtual beachy feel. <laughs> good, good for you, Richie. Uh, well, you, know, you guys are living the dream and I'm simply just trying to fake it. Yeah, you know, hey, well, fake good. it to make it maybe. Indeed. Hi, Rika. Good to see you again. Okay, we'll just wait for maybe one more minute. I know it's half term week. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks for the support. I do think my, my background's probably the best, to be fair. <laughs> I could run outside to the beach. Oh, do you? It'll be fine. Mark can stand up and show you, show you the sea. That's fair, but you know. But I think it's, it's, it's a good background, Richie. You know, it's cool. It's cool. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Peck. Good to see you. Okay, I think we should. I think we should probably get ourselves started. We are 8.02 um, and thank you for joining. And also hello to everybody who's watching on, on playback as I know happens a lot. So um, let's get ourselves started. So um, this morning we have the lovely Suki Thompson on the show. Just as a preamble, Vicky Gosling um, was meant to be on, uh, but un couldn't make it for unforeseen circumstances. But hey, things happen and every cloud has a silver lining. And in this case, a very bright and brilliant silver lining. Um, Suki's been on our list to get on the show for a little while and so it merely means that we've been able to accelerate that so it's wonderful to have you on the show Suki. Thank you very much it's lovely to be here as I was saying I normally do a live oyster catchers session on a Friday morning so Friday's difficult for me but we don't do it because it's half term so it's a real privilege to be here. Well it is, it is lovely to have you on just to give everyone a bit of a background on uh, Suki's uh, career and, and um uh, uh, history. So Suki is chair of Oyster Catchers and XCM, which many of you will know, it's the marketing group of Centaur, um, does lots in our marketing space around learning, media and consultancy. Uh, she is also founder and CEO of Let's Reset, which we'll talk about today um, in a bit of detail because it really is uh, pertinent and poignant. Um, Let's Reset is absolutely focused in the well-being space. So we'll come back to that. But prior to this, uh, Suki had a very successful career agency side and has an incredible reputation as an entrepreneur and business leader. Um, several very high profile MD roles. Um, but what I would say is having met Suki a few years ago, um, I then bumped into Suki at the airport on the way back from Cannes a couple of years ago. Uh, and I don't think we were necessarily waiting for a plane that was late, but there was, you know, it was a, bit of, a bit of dwell time. Uh, and we had a really good chat and we talked quite a bit actually about mental health and well-being. Um, and other personal stuff, I suppose. Uh, and I have to say, Suki's thinking was years ahead of where the conversation was at that time. And so it's perhaps no surprise that Suki's gone on to found Let's Reset, uh, which, as I said, we'll hear, hear more about. So my, my in a nutshell would be Suki is effervescent and inspirational, and it really is a treat to have you on the show. And so I'm going to hand over to Richie to get us started. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Suki, it's an absolute pleasure. I mean, the funny thing is you've clearly met Mark on, on loads of occasions and we haven't had the pleasure just yet. But let me tell you, for years I've, I've known of your reputation. So it's, it's an absolute treat to have you on and to speak to you today and learn more about you and your journey. So we're going to get started. Before we do, though, I just want to pick up on Hugo calling in from Camden Town. I got lots of love for Camden Town. That's where I started my career in the HSBC branch on the corner, where actually same company that I met Mark all those time ago. Perhaps we've got a few more gray hairs these days, but uh, but still have lots of love for Camden Town. So there you go, Hugo. Um, Suki, I just want to kick, kick, kick off and ask, what how's, how's the last year been for you? 
Well, it's been an extraordinary year for so many people, hasn't it? And, you know, and I know in your other programs, lots of people have talked about it. But I think as I reflect, for me, 2020 was going to be a year of at best transition and a, a kind of, you know, in my wildest dreams, transformation. Because if I look back, what I was going to do was uh, I'd moved to being chair of Oyster Catchers, the company that I found. And thank you for that introduction, Mark, um, you know, which was really like my kind of third child over the last 10 years or so, which I'd sold to, to Centaur. And I was moving into a much more a kind of group role there. As you said, I'd started my business, Let's Reset. I'd recently published a book for the first time that you're in, Mark, which is amazing, called Let's Reset with 100 Leaders. Um, both of my children, my daughter's 23, she's called Jazz, and she was a clinical psychologist finishing off her master's, working with me a little bit on Let's Reset. My son was going to be 21, so both leaving home. My partner, Phelan, was very much around. Um, and then at the back of 2019, uh, I had cancer again, uh, which was for me the fifth time I've had cancer. And at that moment, um, my brilliant consultant said, okay, this is the moment for immunotherapy. So we're going into 2020, it's a year, it's amazing immunotherapy now, you shouldn't really feel masses of side effects. I'd first had cancer 12 years ago when I had breast cancer and I'd had lots of chemo, lots of radiation treatment, it was grueling. Um, and I thought, well, okay, that's the thing I've got to do, that's what I'm going to do. So I went into the beginning of the year, you know, pretty excited, the immunotherapy wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I seemed to be controlling it. And then we went into lockdown. And so I think for me, um, you know, of course, it was hard, for, as it has been for lots of people. But I moved to Cornwall. I was with my daughter and then my son. Um, I've had a massively exciting and privileged world for the last year, pivoting both of my businesses, really. Um, and spending amazing time with my children, which I hadn't expected to do. And I finished my treatment at the end of the year. Um, so I'm going into this year in a, in a quite a, a kind of excited place, but um, yeah, not, not the year that perhaps any of us expected. Well, Suki, so uh, I wasn't aware you'd had cancer five times. Um, and I only knew part of what your year had been. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of slightly breathtaking, actually. Um, I mean, let's just not skip through that because that's quite a big deal. And there'll be people on watching in now or watching back later who are or have been going through cancer. So it's, it's maybe slightly ahead of time. But I think I think we should just hear a little bit more about how that journey has been and what resilience you've had to show to get yourself through that. You know, it's it's. Um... It's, a, it's an extraordinary thing for anyone, I think, to go through, and lots of us have had it. You know, there are moments in your life when you just, something hits you very hard. And, and for me, it was getting cancer 12 years ago. I had a lump under my arm, and I, and I remember very clearly going to see the doctor, and he said, and I was doing a lots of triathlons at the time, oyster catchers about 18 months old. Um, and, uh, and he, it kind of wound forward and I looked up and, and I looked as the, the specialist was was putting a pin back into me again to try and do a biopsy. And I looked up at the nurse and I said, you know, if you stick that in my breast again, I'm literally not going to be able to swim tonight because I'm going to have water pumping out of me, kind of making a joke of it. And I looked up at the nurse and, and I saw in her face that I'd got cancer. And I said this to him and he said, oh, you know, you need to speak to the surgeon. And, and I did. I did have cancer. My children were 10 and 12 at the time. So, so pretty young as a single mum. My business was 18 year, months old. Um, but I think what happens then was two things. One is at those darkest moments, and that was pretty dark. And I had a lot of dark moments, you know, for the next year or so as I had my treatment and recovered. Um, something happens, and, I, and it, for me, it was the experience of perhaps the greatest emotion that we have in our lives and that is love and an outpouring of love from people in the industry particularly women from Wackle from my friends my family um, and and actually again as that's gone through and then I so I have gene genetic um, breast cancer gene I have a, then a genetic melanoma gene um, and, and that was extraordinary. So I think for me, that happened. So you realize that if you think you're going to die and people love you, 
you can do extraordinary things. Um, and it happened at work. And I think then the other one is, is something that uh, we now know is a psychological phenomenon, which is um, about kind of emotional growth. So if you've been through a very difficult time, you can have what's called post-traumatic growth. And there's a, a brilliant psychologist called Josie Jacobs, and she did a study on a number of people, and I was in her study around post-traumatic growth and what can happen to you after that. And I think for me, it um, really did focus me for perhaps now the rest of my life on doing things that I really, really want to do. So, you know, you've with that with that response there, you've actually thrown my question off for a six, because I was going to ask around maybe the, the need to wear two hats, where on the one hand, you know, at home, you're going through this extreme trauma and emotional roller coaster. And on the other, you've potentially got to kind of continue in a bit of a BAU world of what you're doing. And of course, you potentially can't even let your clients know. But actually, what I think, perhaps what you've just, as you've said, is actually maybe you don't need to wear two hats at all. Um, and in fact, maybe it is the ability to kind of create and kind of create that and let people know, uh, you know, what's happening and coming together, which is actually where you can actually have the support and love as you talked of. But I would love to just get your perspective on that, because I think a lot of us do try and wear two hats in our, in our different worlds that we live in. And actually, that does cause such mental friction in many ways, especially when values are misaligned. Um, so I'd just love to get your perspective on that and how you were able to navigate through um, across your different aspects of your life in that difficult time. Yeah, it's such a great observation. And, you know, I know Karen Blackett in your program, she talks about covering and we know the impact of covering at work has on you. I, I absolutely didn't know anything about covering or anything else. But for me, there was no way I couldn't tell people. You know, my business was so young. It was Peter Cowie, me, Vic and a few other people. Um, my children were so young. I was a single mom. I was like, well, what am I going to do? I can't, I can't pretend. If I lose all my hair... Um, which actually I didn't lose the whole lot. I, I, there's just no way I could have gone through and not said anything. So I decided that I would be very open. Um, a lot of people in my family have had cancer. So the BRCA gene runs very strongly through our, can through our family. And again, at the time, we didn't really know. Um, cancer treatment has improved dramatically since then. And to be honest, you know, I, over the years, I was a trustee of Macmillan for nine, nearly nine years. Um, and I've met, you know, probably thousands of people who've had a cancer diagnosis and, and not everyone is able to work through it. Not everyone doesn't have long-term side effects. And I've been very fortunate that I've really had very few long-term side effects other than the fact I keep getting cancer, but you know, in between, I don't kind of have anything that impacts me. Um, so it did make me, I guess, very open. Um, and I don't think I realized again at the time, you know, if you're building a business yourself, you create the culture. I don't think I realized that people didn't speak out and it probably wasn't really until the last few years. And, and maybe Mark, even since that conversation we had at Cannes, as I've begun to think about, you know, why does business transformation not work? Why do we not have the conversations we should be having? And it's because we don't feel that we can have our work life and our, on our non-work life intermingling and, 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 and open up in a way that is actually very helpful and positive. Oh, Mark, you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, my apologies. It's like I'm living in an aviary here. There's lots of <laughs> bird song in the background, which is lovely, but probably not conducive. Hey, um, uh, so Suki, I mean, thanks again for going right in at the deep end to talk about your, your health background. And, and I think for a lot of people that will be tremendously encouraging and inspiring. Um, you, you talked about culture just there in that, that last response and, and, so we've talked about COVID in terms of its sort of logistical impact upon us all. Um, a lot of people say culture is created in person. It's sort of inescapable that that's the case. Uh, you, you deal in a lot of the work that you've done through the years has been helping companies in their what, but also in their how and the cultural side. So what impact do you think COVID has had upon culture and relationships? Well, look, we have never seen into the lives of our colleagues, our friends, even our family, in a way that we have in this last 14, 15 months. You know, it's been extraordinary. Uh, Mark, you know, I can see where you are on holiday. Um, you know, I have seen more pets, more families. We've trained thousands of people in this last year. Um, and if I look at my Oyster Catcher life as well, I've, I've interviewed over 150 marketeers, business leaders. I've seen their houses, I've seen their kids. Um, 
And, and that, you know, that, that does put us all in a much more level playing field, I think. Um, and, and that's a fantastic thing. And I think we've also recognized that we do need to actively have a conversation around well-being, around how do people feel, but not kind of like, you know, hi, how are you? Are you okay? Oh yeah, I'm good. But genuinely ask that question. And I think that we have seen the last year that that's happened. And I think for me, the pivotal moment for me in the last few years, when I sold Oyster Catchers um, about four years ago now to Centaur, um, there's a, we didn't use this equation. This is an equation that I, we've now created um, and used with Jeff McDonald um, at Let's Reset, but there's this brilliant equation and I think you'll like it, which is P equals K plus S plus B plus E times E. Now, well, what that stands for, I can see Richie smiling here, is performance, of course, is knowledge, skill, behavior, and experience. So if I look at my oyster catcher world, that's what we looked at doing within the marketing teams. Do you have brilliant knowledge? Okay, if you don't have knowledge, we'll train you. Do you have that skill? We can upskill. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a marketeer, I'm a trained marketeer. I've done an MBA, I've done a postgrad. I love marketing and I believe you should be trained. I'm not, I am like Mark Ritz and I think it's really important to train people. Don't let's let it happen by osmosis. Um, it's really important that you have experience. Behavior is something that I think we've learned is really important. We just haven't been very good at it. We haven't been very good at, at modeling that behavior. Um, but the key is the energy that we have. And unless we focus on that energy and train people in how you can create positive energy, then it doesn't matter how much skill you've got. It doesn't matter how much knowledge you've got. It doesn't matter if you've got all the best behaviors in the world. You literally can't perform. And we have seen that in the last year, haven't we? Because if you get COVID, if you are, if you are, if your health is not there, you, you just can't perform. So keep, uh, first of all, I, I love the, the fact that you, you referenced uh, Jeff McDonald. I think he's just an awesome guy. Uh, and for anyone who, who doesn't know him or hasn't heard him before, um, absolute guru in the, in the wellbeing space and watches his TED talk gives you a great insight. He was a big leader at Unilever and then turned into, into this area. So absolutely brilliant, brilliant guy. Yes, my, my, my best business partner I've got now. So, I, you know, there are a number of people that I now work with a lot. Jeff is one, David Beanie is another, you know, amazing people in this area that I know without COVID, I wouldn't be working with as closely as I am today and leading some of this thinking, I don't think, uh, in the industry. Well, please give him my best when you speak to him. Um, I want to come back on to the, the thought around energy and actually dig a little deeper into where you think you got your energy, perhaps even some of those motivations, perhaps in, maybe from your earlier life, I'm not sure. But love to just hear a little bit about how you were able to get that oomph, perhaps maybe going back into some of those early days, even maybe back into childhood. Mm. Well, it's lovely being uh, in Perranporth, and I've Perranporth is where I, I now have an apartment overlooking the beach, and I feel hugely lucky. I feel lucky for three reasons. One, because it's where I grew up, it's the first job that I ever had was in Perranporth in a surf shop. Um, and I bought it when I sold my business at Oyster Catcher so, to Centaur. So, you know, there's kind of three things that are important to me. My mum, who is an absolute heroine of mine, I adore her. She's 78 years old. Um, she has an extraordinary energy. So I think there's a genetic piece. Um, I probably have an extra battery that, you know, some of us have. I know Mark's got it. Um, I don't have as many batteries as others, but I, I feel kind of, I'm kind of lucky from that point of view. Um, I think also my first job was working in a surf shop. It's called Perrin Surf. It still exists on the, on the high street at Perrin Porth. Um, one of the few shops that, that stayed open, although it couldn't open their doors during lockdown for, to enable people to go surfing. Um, and it was run by an extraordinary man called John Heath. And I was... 14, 15 years old when I first started working for him. And we would start work at Hopper State in the morning, but we would come here from Truro where I grew up um, in his van and he would send me off to surf before we started work. So that was one of the things. He then used to stand at the front of the door and he would welcome customers in. And he would say to us, right, you need to teach them how to surf. He bought skateboarding into the UK. He bought boogie boards into the UK. It was an extraordinarily bright, got a first Oxford, but then felt that he should run the business in Perranporth. 
Um, and he taught us a couple of other things. So if we did really well, if we got our numbers for the week, we'd get like a donut or, a, you know, usually donuts. They were the best thing. Um, he also, at the end of the season, if we met our numbers, we would be able to have a great party on the beach. So he taught me lots of things, which was go and get exercise because it'll energize you. Be really customer focused, you know, be innovative. Um, look after your team. You can reward people, um, but also compassion and kindness gives people energy. Um, so many lessons in leadership and development from so young working in a surf shop. I suppose it shows that the same rules apply absolutely everywhere. Um, I, 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 if that was the start of your career, maybe then to turn to your marketing career. Um, and obviously you started in TBWA. So what, what attracted you to that, that, this world, that world? And how did, you, how did you make your start there? Well, I did a drama degree. I wanted to be, uh, uh, I probably wanted to be an actress. Then I realized I wasn't very good at an actress, so I thought I'd be a director. Um, I actually left drama school, one of the only people with uh, an equity card, because I'd been running a theater in Devon. I was an acting ASM and then I, they made it go equity. So I then actually ended, running up, ended up running the theater. And I'd met this guy from the Stephen Joseph Theater in the round who was their marketing director. And I thought, oh, that's quite, that's quite interesting looks quite fun. I'm clearly not very good as an actress. I better do something I can do. Um, so I'll go and do a postgrad in marketing because what I really wanted to do was to be in the BBC. Um, but I went into this postgrad at Kingston Business School and I loved it. And, I, and actually, I was pretty good. So having done three years of being an actress and being really pretty crap, it was lovely to be doing something that was good. Um, and they came and did, I remember it really well. I went to a, a, one of these you know, sort of marketing type festivals and they said, the thing is, it's really difficult to get into advertising and it's very difficult to get into direct marketing. Um, and I thought, well, that's a ridiculous thing to say. Of course, it can't be difficult. So I just did a sort of creative thing. And, and I actually started off at what was BMP, um, but the below the line BMP Young Clark Craig, and then it merged with Rat Collins. So I did start my life although I was on the BMP kind of, you know, post-grad thing, um, as, a, as a below the line girl. And so I went from there and then I did end up in TBW. I did a couple of other agencies. And I, by then I was a new business person. And I found, you know, I did account handling. And the two things I loved was I loved new business. I loved winning. I loved meeting people. And I loved working with really difficult clients because they were so you know I ran the Debenhams account with Philip Green who used to shout at us and be horrible because I found it fascinating I absolutely loved business and I think for me I loved creativity I thought the creative you know Trevor Beatty I loved working with him um, I love working with the creatives and I was fascinated about how marketing could make a difference but I wasn't um, impressed by the way that women, particularly at that time, were not very senior and they couldn't work um, in flexible ways. So I always remember um, when I got engaged, uh, there was a man called, I don't even know if he's alive anymore, Alistair Ritchie, and he definitely wouldn't remember this. Everyone was going, oh, congratulations, you're getting married, it's so cool. And I was, Alan was in the industry um, and he didn't talk to me. And I'm like, yeah, after three days, I said, Alistair, why are you not actually saying congratulations? He went, well, We've just promoted you to the board. You're the youngest woman we've ever had. You know, I've put you, set you up with this amazing new business director and now you're going to get married. You means you're going to have children. You're going to be no use to me. And on top of that, I expect you're going to change your name. And my name was Suki Bunker, which is a kind of weird name, isn't it? And it was very, very kind of well-known. And it wasn't until that moment I thought, well, you know what? Of course, I'm going to change my name. I'm going to be Suki Thompson. I don't care. And... I will work in the way that I want to work and I will carry on working. And so when people used to say to me, perhaps you won't carry on working. And then luckily I worked for an amazing woman called Gay Haynes in Hong Kong. We went to live in Hong Kong after, just after I got married and I saw what it was like to be an entrepreneur. Um, and so that's how I then left advertising, but I, I've always loved it. And I love working with agencies and I still love going into agencies now. 
Amazing, Suki. There's, there's, there's so much to pick up on that uh, in that response there. But the two, the two thoughts that I have from there, first of all, we've got a bit in common here because actually back, back in my younger days, I wanted to be an actor too. Um, clearly, I found my outlet on the show, guys. Well, hey. But I'm not going give to you, give you much of the drama. Um, but there we go. Actor into marketing. Maybe there's a common thread uh, between the two. Maybe creative outlet is, is part of that, that process. Um, the other thing which I thought was super interesting um, was you talked about your boss on the soft shop in Barrenport. Um, and I think this is fascinating because there's a perception that once you come out of an Oxbridge, you're then going to have this, you know, highfalutin, amazing potential city career and whatever have you. And actually, what I what I admire about, about I forget the gentleman's name, your, your John, John Heath. John Heath. What I admire about John is that I actually went back to do something purposeful in the place that he thought, first, first in the passion point, but also in an area that he felt he could make a big impact in a local area. And I just think that's, fa- I think that's great, quite frankly, because too many people today are forgetting um, that actually there's this, you know, there's, there's a big bad world out there and we actually need to find our own little niche and own little spaces. Um, and I think John was just amazing to do that. And of course, you could see what an impact he's had on the community on the back of running that surf shop for so many years. And you know what? He um, sadly died a number of years ago. And at his funeral, there were a huge number of us who are now entrepreneurs. And we talked about, we could hear John in our heads all the time as we're building our businesses. And it's been fascinating. You're absolutely right. It's an extraordinary legacy. And, and, and so, Suzuki, I want to pick up on that a little bit about the entrepreneur in you. And by the way, I'm totally fascinated about l- hearing a little bit more about the you know, the, the move from getting, you know, selling oyster catchers into Centaur. I'd love to hear a little bit about that, but actually just take us a little bit back in terms of that entrepreneurial vibe spirit. How did you know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? What do you think are some of the attributes? There might be some budding entrepreneurs in the audience today. So tell, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, look, in those times, um, I didn't even know the word entrepreneur. I set up Haystack, which was my business before oyster catchers. And actually before that, I had a gin company. I come from a family of gin makers. Um, Beef Eater Gin was my family business. Um, And everyone, pretty much in the family, that were men worked in the business. So when it was sold to Whitbread, my brother, my cousin, my uncles, but no women. Um, And so when I came back from Hong Kong, I didn't want to go and run an agency, which was the most obvious thing to do, I think, in my career. I was very, very competitive and ambitious. Um, But I thought, having been a new business person, do you know what? That AAR thing, that's okay. But why don't we, I'd been a headhunter in Hong Kong and I didn't really like being a headhunter, but I was fascinated with how it kind of works, you know? And I thought, well, what happens if we ran a business where you could get clients and agencies together and you treat them like you do in the best headhunters and Gay was brilliant like that, but we're, we're helping clients find agencies. Um, so, that, so to be honest, it was just a different way in the market. Um, and I wanted to be able to be a mum. I wanted to be there for my kids. Um, Alan was running an agency and I just thought, you know, this is probably the thing to do. And I think to your point, Richie, um, I was going to have a business partner. I was having an investor and literally weeks before we were about to launch for various, very good reasons, they all fell apart and they all disappeared. So I started it anyway. And I just thought, oh, look, it'll be fine. And it didn't really matter, to be honest. Alan was earning good money. We We had young kids and then it became very successful. And while I was, you know, the, the rest of the industry, David Weddy, you know, other people there, they would go, well, it's fine. Suki does below the line. So I did below the line pitches because nobody else wanted that. It was kind of like the shit end of the industry. But I loved it. So I'd help people find direct marketing agencies, digital, not a bit digital, but the very early bits of that. And then I knew when I made the business work. Because I went to the marketing society and said, look, we'll do this deal and we'll help your your members find agencies. And so we did a kind of promotional deal. And quite understandably, all the rest of the intermediaries were beside themselves. So we went to this meeting and they basically went, no. And by the way, Suki doesn't know anything about the industry. She doesn't know about advertising. I had worked at TBWA. So, you know, kind of did know a bit. Um, You know, she definitely can't do this. And I thought, ah, oh, that's interesting. None of them would speak to me. Literally, I'd walk into a restaurant, I remember, and one of them walked straight out. David Weddy wouldn't talk to me. And so I thought, okay, right, I'll keep going. 
and I'm definitely onto something. And then it actually, it was in uh, a number of years later, they started uh, Ad Forum. And Gary Lace, we were in New York, and Gary said, you know what, I know you and David don't speak to each other. I know you're cross because David tried to close your business down. But I think you should get over yourself and go and see David and, and, and forgive him at two o'clock in the morning. We had a, a gin and tonic together. And then actually he was massively supportive in, uh, in actually the building of Voice to Catchers, but, but also Haystack. So we then became good allies as well as great competitors. Uh, Suki, uh, actually, first off, Richie, I didn't realise you wanted to be an actor. So uh, so learn something there. Um, Suki, you talked about I loved it. And, and that's really what's really refreshing about being in your presence is you do, you know, you, you, you don't hold back when you like something you say, when you don't like something you say, but to be able to say you love to do something, I think if more people could love their jobs, that'd be amazing. Um, just very quickly, Phil McSweeney says so many simple rules that we consistently ignore. I think it's very true. Now you mentioned um, that, that, that boss or that person said, you're useless to me now, you're going to get married, you're going to change your name and so on. And you also said that within Beef Eater, it was mainly the men that worked there. So I just wanted to get your observation from the top on how the diversity and inclusion agenda has moved. Is it, is it really moving? Is it moving fast enough? You've got a good view on this one. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Look, it hasn't moved fast enough. We know this. It hasn't. You know, I think that it's easy in our industry to go, I can see lots of senior women, and there are, and there are definitely more than there were. And we, you know, I think Wackle and, and other organizations, Marketing Society, you know, at Central, we really try to help and support women and diversity. But we saw last year that the rhetoric of inclusion and Black Lives Matter is simply that to a lot of people. And uh, we need to do better. Um, and that doesn't mean that we haven't done some stuff. But we need to be on that journey. And I think, you know, look, I sit on the board of a law firm. And when you're in that kind of sector and insurance companies and a lot of, sorry, Mark, but, you know, um, some of the other sectors where they haven't focused on this. You know, I still go into companies. I still sit in boardrooms where it is predominantly men, where, you know, they say, oh, I don't really think I see the difference between whether it's a man or a woman, whether I've got all white people working there or whether I've got diversity inclusion, but that's the problem. Um, I think we are more aware of unconscious bias and it's great that businesses, large businesses do unconscious bias training and we're, you know, we are really focusing on it, but it's, it's a journey and I still think we've got a way to go. I, I couldn't agree more, Suki, and um, shameless plug at what we're doing at School of Marketing is coming at it from a youth perspective and kind of recognizing and realizing actually the, the problems that exist don't, you know, clearly diversity inclusion in, in, in one respect at the higher level, but actually even when you look at the lower rungs of, of people coming into the organization or people getting then promoted and hired, the exact, exact the same problems as you've identified at the high levels actually exist at, at the lower levels. Um, and actually, what, what's, what's really interesting is I think there's, there's more around ageism than we think. And I, and I think of that both at the top and the bottom age groups and categories. Um, and if I think about boardroom representation, just for one second, right, you, do never, you never really get a 30-something-year-old or a 20-something-year-old sitting at that boardroom. And I actually wonder if we're missing a massive trick here, given the way that the world is moving, particularly in our industry, we should be thinking more about how we actually start to, you know, to bring and elevate even younger people into those conversations, because who on earth are we trying to reach out to in many respects? So I think, you know, there's, there's so many kind of key things that we should be thinking about. And, um, and I wonder if, if as part of that journey, clearly as part of my angle I'm coming at, is how can we elevate young people into those in interesting positions to at least have a voice, have a perspective um, as, as part of that decision making at an organizational level. So, um, yeah, I think, I, I think our hearts and mind are certainly aligned, uh, yes. coming at it maybe from slightly different angles. Um, I want to pick up on a question that Phil is asking, um, and he asks, um, so how do you get over yourself? Um, how do you know you are getting, um, getting in your own way, uh, and what do you do about it? Such a good question, isn't it? Um, Phil, I think, uh, I... I let me tell you a story that might help answer that because um, I used to think that I had great kind of growth mindset. You know, I've run transformation programs for marketing teams for years. That's what I've done. I love it. 
Um, and I think we were quite good at it, actually. But what I realized was that the behavior change didn't happen. So the reason that you don't get over it, that you don't put in place, and I see it a lot at the moment because we've gone through a year when lots of exciting things have happened in marketing. Lots of agencies have changed, lots of marketing teams have changed. But actually what they haven't done is changed their behavior. They haven't put in new ways of working. So I think there's a number of things you need to, to change to be able to do that. But I think um, when we sold Oyster Catchers to Centaur, um, we were, you know, we had six months to do our own app. We were on fire. You know, we were a great team. We were very strong. We were on the top of our game. Um, but it was like oil and water coming together. And what we'd done was everyone had talked about what, what the dream was. You know, why would it work? So why would it work of having their online training with our face-to-face -face training? How we could all work together, how marketing week could link to Oyster Catchers, you know, marketing people. But what we didn't look at is uh, the impact that that would have on us emotionally. Um, and, you know, I love Maya Angelou's quote. I've learned that people will forget what you say people will forget what you did but will never forget how you made it made them feel and no one had talked to us and I don't think they talked to Centaur about how we felt and so many of us number five uh, at the kind of managing partner level um we didn't get over ourselves you know what we spent our time was going is this is really terrible look at their culture they're not very customer focused you know they're not very they don't deal with all these senior people Look, we're amazing and they're just some media company and they were there going these are our great white hope and they're not doing a very good job and as we tried to integrate and interestingly of the five of us three resigned and a number of people from oyster capture resigned and i take full responsibility for that i was not a good enough leader i did not lead it well enough i did not understand how to integrate well enough i didn't have the right conversations um and I didn't get over it myself. And then there was a moment. So Peter, Angus, Vlad all resigned. Richard held on. And then Richard is still there now. He's amazing. Um, and a client of mine, David Wood, and he's now the chief exec of Wix. You should absolutely have him on your show. He's brilliant. He said to me, right, so you can do one of two things. You can leave. No one will mind. You're an entrepreneur. This is your third business. No one would give them monkeys. Um, or you can get over yourself and you can lean in and you can do all the things that you find difficult and stop blaming everyone else and work it out. So when you say that Swag, who's now the chief exec, doesn't understand your business, go and help him understand your business. Understand what a PLC needs and get in there and find a way to befriend them. You know how to make people like you. You know how to understand people. Go and do it. So actually, it was amazing. And I did. And I took swag to the, to the football, which was brilliant. And we love it. And I now absolutely love working for him. And Andrew Vidal was amazing. And it's not, none of them were not nice people. It's just we didn't get over ourselves and we didn't lean in. And I've heard on a number of your people on your program, and we talk about this a lot, don't you? you know, if the culture's not right, leave. And that is right to a certain extent. But I also think you should lean in and try and evolve yourself and those people around you because you can learn so much more from doing that. Um, Suki, brilliant insights. I, I'm conscious we're getting, we've not yes. got too much time left and we haven't really talked too much about Let's Reset, which is your latest thing. Just as an observation, you've done so many various things. You talked about having an extra battery. I think you've got a few extra batteries, but, but of course it's never always perfect. Um, and we all have our ups and downs uh, in terms of health and mental health. So just, just tell us about what Let's Reset is trying to achieve. Um, as you've heard a little bit, I had a crucible moment in my life, uh, which is the thing that I value the most, the thing that we should all value on the most is not our mother, although my mum's pretty important. Um, and it's not our sisters and it's not our friends and it's not even our dog. It is ourself. Our health, our energy is the most important thing. So, you know, Cheryl and Shackle talked about putting the oxygen mask on yourself. And I recognize that many of the transformation programs that I was doing with marketing teams across businesses, with boards, weren't working. 
And they weren't working because well-being in its broadest sense was being nice. It was giving people bananas. It was chatting. It was, you know, saying like agencies often do. We got such a lovely culture, but nobody measured it. How do you know? How do you really know unless you measure it? Well, you know, an engagement survey once a year is not measuring the well-being of people. How many people have a fit for the future program? Virtually no one. How many people properly put well-being at the heart of an organization? And Mark, you are an exception at Direct Line, I think. But most companies I deal with don't. They pay lip service to it. And I felt about it so strongly that what I wanted to do before lockdown was, was enable marketing teams to transform by putting the well-being at the heart of businesses. And because of lockdown, it just has broadened up so much more. So we work with lots of marketing sales, transformation companies, teams, a bit with agencies. But actually now we're putting well-being programs across the whole organization. Um, and, you know, how brilliant if you have as a legacy and as a culture for your business that, um, you know, you feel energized when you come to work. You don't feel frazzled. And of course you feel sometimes, but you know that, that actually we empower people. Um, and I know we're almost running out of time, but I did think it would be helpful. I'm going to just give you five really simple things that you can do. Um, and it is called Can Do. And again, the wonderful Jeff McDonald and David Beanie uh, and some of our psychologists, we have um, a measurement tool called the seven needs of well-being and performance that measure things like uh, how secure do you feel, um, how important is creativity, physical, mental well-being relationships. And there are five things that you can do every day to enable you to be this. And the first one is make connections. So every day I try and spend 10 minutes, you know, with uh, reaching out to a friend, a colleague, a family, or just reveling in nature. You know, this morning I went for a run on the beach and I just stood there for five or 10 minutes. She listened to one of your podcasts going, you know, this is amazing. How lucky am I to be able to walk on the beach in my bare feet? The second one is active. So I did a bit of a double whammy this morning. Uh, you know, I love surfing, but you can walk, you can swim, you can do yoga. Just spend time every day um, to do that. The next one is just be nice. You know, you don't have to always be horrid. And I think we've seen this little acts of kindness are so important. Just, you know, giving something to somebody is, is a lovely thing to do. And the next one is discover. We talk about creativity when we measure it. Um, learn something new. Read. Go listen to one of your podcasts. Come and, you know, listen to stuff we've got at Let's Reset. Keep those neural pathways open. Um, and the last one is the one I found the most difficult, but I've really tried to work on for the last year is observe. Take five minutes to literally do nothing, to detox, to get rid of everything around you. Um, to turn off all those notifications, to look up from your screen. It's really important for our, our brains to, to look outwards. Um, and there are 1,440 minutes in the day. So when we do this with, with teams all the time, they go, but yeah, it's really difficult because I haven't got enough time. And time is the absolute problem we all have. But if you've got 1,440 minutes in the day, Richie, Mark, even you, can take 60 of those minutes and do a combination of those things. So connect, be active, be nice, discover, observe, and it will make a fundamental difference to yourself. And then if you measure your performance and well-being through something like the score that we have, you can enable and train your teams to work effectively together. So okay, thank you for that. That's a lovely model and that's certainly one that I'm, I'm gonna reflect on. And I'm, I'm really glad to think that, you know, we've already kind of fulfilled the first scene between us this today, forged new connections there. So that's just absolutely super. Um, I think a lot of the time why we, certainly for me personally, when it comes to the, the can do and why, you know, we always use time as the excuse is because I think we're operating in this sort of hyper productive environment all the time where we do, if we, if we feel we're not productive during those, the course of the working day, we almost feel like we're not doing something. And, and I think that's a mindset that, uh, that I need to try to overcome myself as we, as we, we go into this. Maybe others feel the same. Um, but look, we're, we're unfortunately really out of time. It just really flies by. 
Um, so the only thing I can do, first of all, is to say a massive thank you, Suki. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and more so than that, just you know, really grateful that you've shared some pretty intimate things, um, both about your life journey, but then also how you've been able to cope and deal with them. So I think that would just be super helpful um, to many and, and certainly myself. But um, I'm going to just kind of talk a few, a few reflections from me and hand over to Mark um, for his reflections and then, and then to close. Um, so the first thing that you you came across, and the most the first one most powerful thing you said was the greatest emotion being love, and I love that. Um, but I think actually what what that for me was interesting is because it it actually disseminates into so many aspects of your life, and I think you talked about it certainly, um, you know, as as an emotion for others, but actually what comes across wholeheartedly is is the love that you have for your life, for your family, for you know, your, the, the thought of exactly where you're, where you're sitting right now and the love that you have for, that, for those things that you get to walk on a beach or you, you love the, the, you know, the, the start that you had in life in, the show, as, uh, in, in a surf shop. I just thought that that was a very powerful concept that, that you brought, um, you know, literally at, at the get-go. Um, the openness, um, whether it's in conversation just like this, openness with the team, I think has been a key ingredient to your success. You know, you're just, you know, you are, you are who you are and you're going to be who you are. Um, and, and people will, will, will love that. Although there have been times when you've actually had to adapt and change. And that whole concept around lean in to actually get to where you want to go and actually, you know, evolve and adapt your style and approach, um, I think is something that all of us can take away. Um, interesting, you talked about the CEO of Wix. Um, that was my first, my first part-time job, by the way, Wix. <laughs> Um, Wix in Carlisle was my first uh, my first Saturday job, um, and uh, can't say it was the best job in the world, but but certainly was one that I had lots of lessons from. Um, you talked about the you know the, the 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 thought around oil and water when you first started integrating into Centaur and how some of those challenges, but how you were able to overcome those challenges really successfully as well. So just a few key things from me, and of course, can do as a model just is is, is a really powerful one and one that we will be all taking away. So thank you, Suki. Absolute pleasure. I'm sure we're going to continue this conversation over to Mark. Thanks, Richie. Uh, good summary. I, I also have that sense of gratitude. I think there's just a lot of joy in what we've heard in the last 45 minutes. And, and it actually takes me back to the conversation we had those years ago, Suki. So, um, so thank you for that. I mean, a couple of things for me, uh, the concept of post-traumatic growth um, is something I'd not heard before, but that, that's, that's definitely caught my ear. Uh, you talked about energy and batteries. I think we've seen that come through in spades. Um, and the lessons from uh, a, a start out in a surf shop that turned out to be so much more than that. Um, you also have told us like it is a little bit in terms of there's a lot of rhetoric and not earth action post BLM regarding uh, diversity and inclusion. And also a lot of lip service around well-being. And for both of those subjects, I know that you properly lent into it where others have just maybe talked about it a bit too much. We all need to get over ourselves, And I think the, the can-do model is a pretty damn good way of doing that. Um, and so, yeah, I think the work you're doing with Luxury Set is brilliant. It's much needed. And congratulations for, for that. I know it's only getting started, though, and a long way to go. Um, but, yeah, more than anything, uh, a lovely sense of joy on a Friday morning. And, and most of all, thank you for sharing your story and, and battle and ongoing journey with cancer. Uh, it takes a lot to be able to share that sort of stuff, stuff in this environment. So enormously appreciative for that, Suki. And, and so just thank you, a massive thank you for coming on the show. It's been lovely. Oh, it's been an absolute joy. Thank you very much. If there is anyone who has had a cancer diagnosis or has somebody close to them, Macmillan's a fantastic place to reach out and get some support. And I'm sure we can give those details. And uh, we look, we, uh, let's reset. We want to touch a million people because I believe that if you can touch a million people, you can change fundamentally the way that we work and this is the moment. So I'm really grateful to come on your show and talk to you, but also if there's anyone that thinks that, you know, just by focusing on well-being, we can change the way of the workplace for the future generations, then uh, that would be a great thing to do. Thank you very if much, any, a lovely day. If anybody can, then, then you can, Suki, thank you again. And just as a final note, um, thanks for joining today. If you uh, liked it, please come back and tell a few other people. And next week we have Mark Reed. CEO of WPP. Uh, so we had Martin Sorrell before, so Martin Sorrell, who was previously WPP CEO. We've now got the uh, Mark, who is currently. Um, so I think a few interesting stories around the world of WPP coming from Mark, who's a massive heavy hitter in the industry, of course. But for now, thank you for dialing in. Thank you again, Suki, and great weekends, everyone.